Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, welcome back and thanks for joining us for episode 10 of Whelm Season 4. My name is Rich and with me is my co-host Emily and producer Neil. Hey everybody, in these review episodes we'll be diving into the plots, characters, easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Moat. Of course, this is all about you! Only now, you won't open your mind to me at all! And what in our history makes you think I would ever- You are the most unforgiving excuse for a sister! Wait a minute, wait! Nothing I do will ever be enough! Will it? Emory, I'm a professional guidance counselor! I know you're trying to gender a catharsis for me! Is it working? No, I don't bet! <laughs> and with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is Nomad Asir or Demon Rise Backwards. The release date was December 9th, 2021. The in episode date was May 14th. The writer was Kevin Graveau. The director was Christopher Berkeley, and the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits this week are Tom Adcox as Clarion, Usman Ally as Khalid Masur, Erica Ishii as Mary Bromfeld and Child, David Kay as Vandal Savage, Varl Jot and Arian, Nolan North as Zatara, Kevin Michael Richardson as Martian Manhunter and Naboo, David Shaughnessy as Jason Blood and Etrigan the Demon, Lauren Tom as Thirteen. Hinden Walsh as Emery Johns. And D.B. Woodside as Phantom Stranger. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens with a flashback of Vandal Savage rebuilding his village of Atlantis after Clarion's attack. Centuries later, the town has grown into a powerful city-state led by Vandal's 200-year-old grandson, Arian. And then back in the present day, the Magic Scouts regroup after their fight and are approached by Phantom Stranger. Over in Roanoke, Child and Clarion have a confrontation, and Child reveals that she's been sent to kill and replace Clarion for his many, many failures, especially his alliance with Vandal Savage. And meanwhile, Beast Boy's still having a time, and now we get to see that McGann is also having a time during the awkward family road trip back to Earth, and Emery really doesn't know how to help her little sister at all. Hashtag all the time. Everybody's all the times are being had. In a flashback, we learn that Arian was gifted a crown from the Lords of Order that infused his bloodline with magic, leading to the evolution of magic users on Earth alongside metapowered individuals. The crown's magic also led to great advances in technology and expansion of power and political control. In the present, the Phantom Stranger teleports Satana to Roanoke to witness the battle between Clarion and Child. In a flashback, we learn that Vandal Savage wanted to sink the capital of Atlantis so that he could conquer the ocean but his grandson, Arian, refused. Back in the present, Phantom Stranger teleports the Magic Scouts to the Sanctum Sanctorum of Jason Blood to learn more about the magical activity that's been happening and recruit him to help defeat Child. Jason Blood then summons forth the power of Etragon the Demon. Meanwhile, back on Baby Bioship, Emery baits McGann into a fight to help her work through some of her emotions. And Baby Bioship almost gets hit by a... The school bus that has nothing to do with anything. Uh, more on that later. Back on Earth, Phantom Stranger teleports Etrigan to Roanoke to help with the fight, but he proves less than effective. And in yet another flashback, Clarion and Vandal make a new agreement a thousand years after their first encounter, in which Clarion sinks the Atlantean capital at Vandal's request and then proceeds to sink the entire continent for his own amusement. Eventually, the kingdom of Atlantis took over the entire ocean, and Clarion insisted on continuing his new alliance with Vandal. Back in the present, the fighting in Roanoke continues, with Child eventually kind of destroying the whole surrounding area in a magical disaster, as one does. Zatanna is almost drowned in the flooding, but is saved by Halid and the rest of her protégés, and announces that they need more help if they're going to end this. And in our final scene, it's revealed that the flashbacks we've been seeing this episode have been Vandal Savage recounting the tale to Dr. Fate to convince him to help save Clarion from Child, because while both are Lords of Chaos, one is far easier to manage. 
Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. That's where we're all at. Right. Oh. That is where we're at. Who wants to start? So so my main question as a result of this episode is excuse me, what is what is the Earth 17 fiasco? What is it? I wanna know. I want I want that tie-in comic. What was that weird, weird Clarion episode we never got to see? Neil, do you have an answer for this? Oh, I'm glad you've asked. I have currently <laughs> five tabs open to go backwards through time to try and figure out what could possibly be going on. Um, what I will say is like just out front, the collective through line is nuclear explosion of basically every version of Earth-17. Um, so the latest one for the new 52 in the multiverse, because they add more than just the 52, is a world laid waste by nuclear war in 1963 and home to the Atomic Knights of Justice, where they are currently led by Adam Strange searching for the Cosmic Grail. So Love there's that. Comics and, so wow, much. wow, hold on. Wait, hold on. how many more of these okay. do you got? Because I gotta process just that one for a minute. Okay, I have <laughs> I have basically <laughs> three more. So though that is kind of a mix of two from like the whenever there when there were only 52 Earths that we played with. And then I'll go all the way back to before Infinite Crisis. Okay, wait, uh, hold to, to round wait. us out. Wait. Okay. So it's been a little while since I've caught up on some comics current time. There are now more than 52. They just gave up on all that. Is that what you just said? Uh, no, no, no. So then, sorry, it, the new 52, there are 52. In okay. the old, there were more. So like pre-infinite, like, pre-crisis in the 80s, there was however many we wanted. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. I'm like, wait, they just kind of gave up on the 52 now? Okay, great. Yeah. All right. Okay, Cosmic Grail, Adam Strange. Adam Strange, Atomic Cosmic Knights. Grail, Atomic Knights, Nuclear Holocaust, 1963. I'm caught As one up. does. Yeah. What's, what's your second one? So before that, the version of Earth-17, was there was also a da- disaster simply referred to as the Great Disaster. Some say it evolved, involved atomic weapons. Others say the mysterious chemical called Cortexin. And little is known except it is described as glowing with radioactivity and hope. No, you got to pause. All- no, we got to pause for a okay. second. Say okay. that a chemical okay. glows with hope. Wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the whole Say that last sentence glowing. again. Say I got you got to say it again. What was that again? Little is known about this earth except that it is described as glowing with radioactivity and hope. The <laughs> earth, the whole earth, the whole planet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's home to intelligent animals and human slaves who have mostly lost the power of speech. Why does it why does it glow with hope then? Wait. That sounds like Commandy or something. What? Okay. Okay. Combine that with Earth 86 is a world in which a 20-day atomic war devastated much of Earth on October 9th, 1986. What remains is guarded by the Atomic Knights and Hercules. <laughs> okay. Neither one of those and did I expect at all. I certainly didn't expect and Adam Strange and and Hercules. Okay. I mean, why not? And then to round us all the way out, uh, Earth 17 spelled out instead of using numbers um, is a bad world uh, where everything has gone wrong. Oh, because the other Um, ones were going well. Is that what they're... Okay, great. Got it. Got I it, just got love it, the description of the world where wait, 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 everything wait. has this is gone the bad wrong. Part. <laughs> this is the bad one. This is the bad one. Not the other. Those are fine. Atomic Knights were good. They're, they're heroes. So on this one, superheroes were created as part of a government experiment, uh, with the first hero being Overman, uh, which is the Superman analog. Um, the rest of the heroes on this planet are modified clones grown from his ske- his cell scrapings. Oh, wait, there isn't more to that. That's just the, that's period. That's the end of the setup. And apparently then everything goes wrong. Yeah. Uh, no, they just start making all of the superheroes. There is analogs for Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, and they're all controlled by the U.S. military. But they're all clone knockoffs yes. of Overman. Correct. OK, that's there's where. So there's your problem right there to start with. <laughs> So 
Oh, that's right. Overman somehow gains access to a doomsday bomb. There it is, which he intends to set off to destroy the world and take it, take himself with it. Interesting. So it sounds like wrong. it sounds like the plot from the animated movie Crisis on Two Earths to an extent. Mm, yes. So it sounds like that that group of where the Justice League the Justice League were actually villains in that. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Okay, interesting. So you think any of these could be? What did you mean? Earth seventeen spelled out instead of numbers? Is that different than Earth seventeen with numbers? Mm-hmm. So that's pre. So pre crisis, like is an delineation uh, of pre crisis. You spell you spell it out, and then it's like a lot easier shorthand to notice that it's that because uh, you have pre crisis, yeah, and then once sense. crisis hits, you have the multi. I believe the term is the multiversity where you can go up to Earth 86, but then you have the new 52 where it is locked more at the 52, but then they're all at different points. So in the new 52, Earth 17 and Earth 15 are basically across each other, across from each other. And there are like special things about that. So, okay. I love comics. I mean that sincerely. No, seriously. Right. For as much as we're laughing at a planet a planet that glows with hope and an Earth protected only by Hercules and some other glows people. Glows with radiation and hope. I think that's oh, what uh, I- yeah, for that the Hercules one, it also notes that all food is canned and money is worth it. <laughs> so there you go. Amazing. Nice. So all of those are possibilities. Or just something else that Clarion came up with. There is always a possibility that it's nothing we could ever track down. None of those things. Yeah. Now I was thinking in D and D, I can't. I'm not going to be able to think of radiant damage not as radiation and hope uh, combined <laughs> that's together. That's why it hurts. That's why it hurts the undead. That's why it hurts evil people. It's full of radiation and hope. I love that. Oh my gosh! Perfect. Okay, that was question one. Yeah. <laughs> what else do you got, Emily? <laughs> I spent a lot of time on looking into that. <laughs> oh, tw- I'm impressed. I rolled 12 hope damage. I'm sorry. <laughs> I rolled 12 could I? 12. Destroys the 12. zombie. Okay. Radiation and hope. What are my <laughs> notes? Sorry. I'm I still trying to get over Earth. Completely off Close track. with hope. So I don't have any more questions. I'm sure I'll have more questions later. I'm sure we will get into some stuff that I do not know and have not heard of. And I look forward to that, Neil. But some of my other observations for this. We get the scene where Beast Boy is very sad and he's flipping back through photos on his phone, being sad and missing Connor, as we all are. And there's one photo that is him, young him, like season one him, and McGann and Connor in what looks like Bialia. And my best guess for that, for my research, (laughs) is that that's actually from when they visit Bialia in the tie-in comics uh, is the only time that technically McGann's outfit is a little different than it is in the comics because she's wearing kind of like adventure human gear for a bit there instead of like her going to school outfit in the comics. She's like wearing like jeans and a tank top for like the only time in the series in the comics. But it's the only time that works out timeline wise that we would see it uh, because in that tie-in comic, it is part of the flashbacks in the Invasion miniseries from the tie-in comics, where mid-season one at one point, Superboy and Miss Martian had to go to Bialia to stop Queen Bee from, I think, assassinating someone, if I'm remembering correctly. Just another another Queen Bee plot. And they briefly stop by and visit Garfield, and it's cute, but it also that comic also ends with us seeing how Marie Logan dies um which is kind of implied to take place shortly after all of that like right so it is the only time that i can really think of the three of them all kind of being happy in bialia would have been during that or around that time period for some reason i'm having like a memory of that tie-in comic that they were going to assassinate harjafti's daughter or something like yes. that i think it's something like is that. that what it was i haven't I read to, it in a little bit it. so i don't remember all the details of the plot it's a cool comic. Check it out. It involves Superman showing up as Clark Kent briefly, uh, who's there to apparently do a story. Yes. And McGann immediately clocks him as Superman and <laughs> freaks him out. And it's my favorite thing. That's <laughs> Just telepathically connects to him and is like, hi, Superman. And he's like, what are you talking about, strange telepathic teenager? And she's like, stop it. I know you're Superman. <laughs> like, how do you know I'm Superman? She's like, I live with Connor and he looks like you. 
<laughs> like that's her answer. That's, that's, She's like, I know, I know Connor's face better than Connor knows his face. <laughs> and you look like those, him, but older. Those glasses, not fooling anybody. I'm just telling you. Because <laughs> Connor doesn't recognize him, and that's why it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that's extra funny. Uh, my kids and I just got done watching through season two. So they'd watched bits and pieces of it with me before. We've tried to start it, uh, but we hadn't gone in a big run. And so um, we just got done with season two. So now they can go back and read the tie-in comics that have happened up through um, season two. So Grayson's been doing that as part of his reading time for school, which has been pretty cool. So I, I'm going to go back and reread them as well. It's been, God, it's been, I think the last time I read them through is when we had Christopher Jones on talking about the comics during comic commentary. That's my little Easter egg. Sad photos. So I'm going to say something sad. Yeah, I'm going to say something sad about even more sad. Oh, oh no, go for cool. it. And then we can move on. You've already, you've like, already nuked like three years. Yeah, so what else are you going to do? But one of it's them blows the with hope. <laughs> with hope. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, my bad. Yes. <laughs> Two bad ones. One's uplifting. <laughs> I would be surprised if it is not meant to imply that he looks at those pictures because it's the last time he felt like he was happy. Yeah. Um, because yeah. if it's right before his mom passes away, that's the catalyst for everything that is this emotional state. So I would wager that it is with that intent to look at those to just to look back on the last time he felt like he was truly happy. That comment, Neil, does not radiate with hope. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no. It it does not. No, but it, it sounds right. That sounds right. Oh, if- so as a total aside and a hard, hard left in the background images, um, when their places, there's in-window air conditioning units. And I just want to say that that is such a level of attention to detail that was not lost on me. So dear background artists, thank you, I guess. Just the idea that like you're in a town where they would all have AC units in their windows, which is much more difficult to draw. In the sense that it will take more time. But yeah. There they are. Yeah. To just immerse you. Now you're there. I like it. What else you got, Emily? This is going so well and uplifting. What's next? All well, the notes are just about sad stuff. Uh, this is also the episode where we get a little little bit of the awkward Martian family road trip <laughs> back to Earth, <laughs> as I call it, uh, just to make it a little lighter as I cry. I love the moment in this as Emery is like, I don't know how to help my sister. I don't know what's going on. I She's just sad all the time, and I don't know how to fix that. And Martian Manhunter's like, we just need to get back to Earth because she needs to be with her family. And Emery's like, well, we are her family. And Martian Manhunter is like, Shh, no. Like, he doesn't say though? no, really? but he's like, <laughs> yes. But he- you haven't talked to her for 10 years, kind of thing is like the implication is like, no, she needs to get back to Earth where the team is, the team who actually understand who she is now and what her life is like and not who she was when she ran away from home 10 years ago. Because I think a lot of it is how Emery kind of has this idea in her head of like, who McGann is and what McGann's life is like that she just keeps kind of projecting onto McGann. And it's this Martian Manhunter being like, you don't you don't know anything about what McGann's life is like. And I like it. It's a good moment Um, because, mm-hmm. yes, let let McGann get back to Earth. Let her get a hug from Artemis and everybody deal because <laughs> nobody knows how to deal right now, though, as in addition to that, my favorite thing is uh emery starting the fight with mcgann over absolutely nothing just so that mcgann can yell i'm a professional guidance counselor i know you're just trying to generate a catharsis for me <laughs> like is I it working a little bit uh is my favorite interaction in this episode because <laughs> it's so good and they both they perform it so well and it's very fun and very moving at the same time because then of course, McGann just breaks down after that, and it's her letting herself feel and all that stuff. But again, I like I, I just like McGann being like, I know exactly what you're doing, and I'm mad about it. <laughs> uh, it's very good. It's both fun and heartbreaking. And those are my main notes, because most of the rest of this episode is a DC Comics Easter eggs and Vandal Savage flashbacks. So I'll hand this off to Neil, who knows lore and flashbacks. <laughs> Spe- speaking of Easter eggs and tying directly to the scene you're referring to, one, oftentimes when w- when we do the review episodes, I'll 
usually turn the closed captioning on because I know when we were watching it, when it was when they were releasing, sometimes there were bits you could pull from that. So the funniest thing from the closed captioning was when it referred to her as Emery hyphen Rita, as if I wasn't sure. I, and I get it. Like, it, it helps. I mean, oh, gosh, I didn't think of this until now. If I go back, are there different versions? Is it like Emery hyphen Martian form? Like, I don't like I don't well, I don't think so, but maybe I know at least one time when I watched them with the closed captions on, they labeled a uh, Emery line as McGann saying it. So that was confusing. So that's also when we get the exclamation OMC instead of OMG. And I am I refuse to pronounce right. this. Yep. So what does the C refer to, Emily? Ceridial. Aha. So was that so I know it was mentioned in Needful, but for some reason I, like in my head I feel like it came up other times, like before then, but I could I could certainly be wrong. Uh, also, she refers to it as Third Rock from the Sun, which is a 90s sitcom. And I super hope like that's how far yeah. behind they are on sitcoms still. Um, and oh, yeah. And, so that yep. is just my my headcanon is that they are referring to the mid 90s sitcom. I want to believe um, Third Rock from the Sun. I want to believe. <laughs> oh, I that's got to be. It's got to be. <laughs> What else? I mean, I can get, I can keep going. So the only, the only spell of, the only spell of note, like the others are shield and levitate. I mean, at this point, levitate is used often enough. Like you can just, you can hear it and know exactly what it is. But the one um, to wake up Khalid was, um, let's see, splash his face with water. You know, just make water come out of nowhere. Totally fine. Physics do not apply to Zatanna. Oh, Varl Jot which is probably one of the funnier ones. So Varl Jot, and this is to quote, ask Greg 25988 directly. Basically, it's a reworking of one of Vandal's old aliases from the comics. Carl Jot from the Adam 5, I believe. It's not definitive the old Carl was Vandal, but I like to think so. And referring to someone as old Carl really made my day. I'm just laughing at the idea of Vandal Savage ever going by Carl. It is I, Carl. I don't know why it's so funny to me. You know what? He's had all these cool, like, you know, names that have all these, you know, strength and power associated with it. But he's got to just be like James at some point. You know what I mean? Like John Smith. You can be a John, oh, too. Yeah. You know, like. You know, he's just going to have to be somebody. I don't know. Of course, in our recap, I wrote it all as Vandal Savage for simplicity's sake and just to make it clear who we're talking about. Because, you know, the right. visuals of an episode help make that clear. But he does have so many names during this stretch of episodes. The other one yes. is uh, that Tracy uses Hello, Megan, which is always fun to hear other people. I, which is really funny. But also, I realize Clarion uses an adaptation of it, where it's like, hello, I think he says moron, or like something to that effect, which is super funny. Also, carp instead of crap uh. is very funny to me. Carp, carp, it's, carp, carp, carp. I actually say holy carp all the time now <laughs> with my kids. You had a thing in here about uh, misplaced. Mm -hmm. So when he refers to a world without grownups, that's essentially the the original storyline that created the idea of young justice so hearing it referred to as like that specifically because i can't remember if it was referred to that way back in that episode i mean it may have been it is okay it yeah. is billy batson yes. calls it i've says i've been in a world without grown-ups to right. batman when he's as captain he's Marvel. sam yeah yeah which <laughs> led to young justice original creation in the comic books itself and then of course project rutabaga Back in early warning, which that was fun until it wasn't fun. And then we saw it and it was real, real not fun of a project. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's a rutabaga. Jason Blood is really, really old. Yeah. Super old. He was born roughly in the year 500 AD, at which point then he got tied to a demon because Merlin's a jerk, I guess. Or they decided that together. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how they take it in the Young Justice universe, unless you've gone through the several thousand Ask Gregs to find out. But he's a Merlin. He refers to Merlin as his half brother. 
Which is interesting, but he but that references once he's Etragon, not Jason. No, no, Jason. Right, right, right. So Jason's just a human, if I remember correctly. And Etrigan is Etrigan and Merlin have the same dad, uh, Belial, one of the demons. Ooh, Belial, I think. Belial, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Diablo. So Lord. he. That's how I know my demon so, name pronunciation. I was like, oh, I forgot. Uh, Neil actually knows like Christian history. He's like, oh no, it's from a video game. Asmodeus. Anyway, Lilith. Right. Yeah. So he. So and and Merlin was supposed to have been half demon so they share the same share the same dad with different moms so yeah etrigan is merlin's half brother but i think jason blood was just a, just this guy you know he was just, just a guy in 500 ad which i mean which alludes AD. to like all of the things that he has i mean both from being like studying in you know, demonology, the occult and things of that nature, because you're stuck with a demon for hundreds and hundreds right. of years. So like, I, while I want to think that there are more Easter eggs in there, part of it may just be things that he's collected over time. And some of the more notable things are the literal three keys of power from gargoyles, which from gargoyles, which yeah. mind you, when united that can transform the bearer into an absolute and almost invincible sorcerer and he has all three just hanging out the first time i the first when i first watched it i didn't quite i was like oh that must be something and then they flipped to like the book and i was like that book looks weirdly familiar and then they had the am the amulet thing the eye of odin and i was like that's that's from gargoyles. I was like, wait a minute. So the first, the first one probably has the biggest redesign, and so that is the Phoenix Gate, a magical talisman that allows whoever uses it to travel through both time and space. Yeah. So there's that. Then you basically have the Grimorum Ar the Grim Arcanorum, War Grimoire Grimorum, uh, which basically yep. has the original spell that created the gargoyles and then the eye of odin which is the eye that odin sacrificed in order to gain greater wisdom so in case for some strange reasons people have listened through 260 whatever episodes of whelmed and don't get this or this is your first episode uh greg weissman was the creator of the disney disney gargoyles tv show so this is what we're referring to is that these three items that are in jason blood's apartment is are from that original cartoon back from the 90s which is a fantastic the first two seasons are particularly just great stuff if you haven't seen it go back and watch it they are available on disney plus right now yeah the idea that those are all just hanging out just oh and also uh there's a gargoyles cooperative board game that came out for the 25th anniversary i want to say uh it's actually a ton of fun it it's not a very fast it's not a very long game and it's a cooperative board game that if you're a parent listening and have kids uh, or, you know, it's, you can all play it together. But two of these three items are in the game. So there's one of the one of the uh, missions involves the Eye of Odin. Another mission involves them getting the book. So you'll be able to see those from there. So I recommend going to get that. I, I found it to be pretty fun. I've been playing with my kids quite a bit. Anyway, that was a big aside. So for the lit major in all of us, a term was used that seemed weird it's actually the whole reason i turned on the closed captioning um so the term vasty deep as in reference to the ocean uh is very specifically keyed back to shakespeare specifically with henry the fourth and henry the fifth um as basically the mm. only places that it shows up so then like when it's in dictionaries it just the dictionary references shakespeare as like yeah yeah it's a shakespeare word like doesn't really give a lot of definition to the word and then the theory is like there's no history he just kind of there's a chance he just made it up to make it fit the rhyming scheme which he did yes. a lot yeah. and so it was a just lot. like oh okay well that's it vasty yeah shakespeare no 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 there you go and i just i think it proves that i'm a theater and english double major the fact that it never registered to me that that would be odd for someone to use in a cartoon <laughs> that you wanted to go check it and figure out what was up with it and i was like oh yeah yeah that phrase people use that all the time all the time it's everyday thing oh, vast yeah. Deep. yeah you know <laughs> yeah ocean it's vast i used to i used it yesterday to refer to my soup pot 
My soup pot's fast too deep. You used a spoon that was too small. You know, when you go to stew, yeah. you dropped it into the vasty deep. Yeah, you of can't soup. get into yeah. the vasty deep. I couldn't reach the bottom. Yeah. Neil knows me. He knows how we talk. Vandal also hits Naboo with the exact same line from the, the Phantom Stranger used on him not an episode ago, which I think is very funny. I can't say that next part. I put it in crashing the mode. So all the the tag at the very end is probably the scariest version of Vandal I've ever seen because he's scared. How uncomfortable is that of like Operation Lifeboat? Hey, everything of importance on the Earth, we need to take it to Rich's favorite place, the War World. The War World. But what I think is, God, Vandal? I, guys, Vandal has never been this good in the comics. Mm. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of exposition. I know Emily is tired of his nonsense. What I a like his presence as a character. I think he is an interesting <laughs> character. I just maybe don't care enough about 15 minutes of flashbacks about how he came to be and met Clary and then found the you. city and everything. I'm like, just show me that shot and, of him on the world world being like, grab everything and go. And I'm like, that's very interesting. I am in, yes, I'm invested in that. Emily is all about the vandal that is, not the vandal that was. Yes. <laughs> yes, I understand. <laughs> so having him be there and be like, I'm just like, oh man, he's like, and you know what? Extend the same courtesy to, to Ra's al Ghul and his family. And I'm just like, don't make me like you. You know, like that's just like a honorable, straight up kind of thoughtful thing to do. You know what I mean? Like, mm, okay. And then also, yeah. But is it honorable or is it because he he says extend the offer to Raish. He won't take it, but extend it anyway, which to me makes it feel like there's almost a level of being like, say it just in case the world doesn't blow up so that I still have a lifeline with Raish al Ghul. You know what? You're not wrong. <laughs> but but the likelihood that he would care more about Raish than some of the others, I think it's a little higher because of how long Raish has been around. I think his investment yeah in most of the other people that join the light is lower because me like they're you know in his grand scheme of things me they'll be around lex is a nothing. tool yeah lex is a hot second tool yeah. right there i'm just he's just like hey you're yeah you're like a razor for me i'm just gonna throw you away afterwards you're dead you're dead in like the race years, just keeps right? coming back race just doesn't stop but that also brings me to jason blood too because i'm definitely curious about how many times jason blood has run across vandal and what's going on with vandal because that's a 500. Yeah. He's I'm trying to think of who else might be in the DC universe that old. I mean, besides the helmet of Naboo or whatever, but like, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. That's 1500 plus years old, 1800 years, 17, 1600 years old, whatever. So like we watch Clarion. So is Clarion. Here's the thing. Is Clarion's powers magic? Do we all agree that Clarion's powers are magical? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so the Lords of Order and the Lords of Chaos powers are magical? Yes. Yes. Okay. So Etrigan's fire is hellfire. So like it's he expects this to do a lot of things that you would not expect. So his his hellfire is like it's radiation and hope, basically, is what yeah, his hellfire yeah, yeah, yeah. is. Like it's it, you know what I mean? It's the, like whatever the, the opposite inverse. of that is. Yeah. It's the inverse it's of hope. Right. It's it's immolation and despair is what yeah. it is. Uh so he he's able to like wreck stuff that you know that you would not expect. It's not just like he's got a flamethrower. Like it just r destroys things to their it's like atomic fire. You know what I mean? It's like goes down to its like elements. And so when he hits flaw with it. And then nothing happens. It makes me wonder if he'd hit flaw with it when the other chaos lords were not around, like not backing mm -hmm. her up. If that would have done something, because it's it's his hellfire is not nothing. It's it's not just a dragony breath or whatever. And he himself, even as a even as a demon among demons, Etrigan is he, he Etrigan is like I think of him like Etrigan is to other average demons the way that Superman is to humans. Even among demons, Etrigan is incredibly powerful, massively regenerating. Like he even has powers of telepathy and precognition to some extent. Like they, they've done a ton of stuff with him in the comics. 
So he's not a, it's not like, oh, I got this cool little demon. He's going to run around, do some stuff. It's like, no, no, he's basically turning into demon Superman. And it, what's extra funny to me, or I guess not funny, but like I, ironic, I don't know. So DC Comics, when, when Etrigan was created, DC wanted to try to add some more kind of horror characters to their line. And at the time, Jack Kirby was writing, he was writing The New Gods and he was writing uh, The Forever People which were his big things. Like, if you want to hear about the history of that, you should go listen to uh, Jeff Stormer talk about Jack Kirby on our discussion episode. You can find that in our reprints episodes of just type it in reprints and wherever you're listening to podcasts and find the Jeff Stormer one. So you can listen to Jeff talk about how important the new gods were to Jack Kirby. So they asked Jack, basically they're all talking about, uh, I think Mark Evanier was there was Jack's assistant at the time, I think. And they were talking about creating a new character. And so they were talking about a bunch of stuff, brainstorming. I think they were at lunch or whatever. And they somehow they started talking about the demon came up and that got stuck into their heads. And then they're like eating lunch. And then Jack's like, all right, so there's this guy named Jason blood. And he just goes, Bruh! and he just like, just like writes the whole first step first issue. And, but Jack didn't, he didn't like horror comics. He didn't, he wanted to do these, like, he wanted space gods, right? Like, yeah. he didn't wanted to do this other stuff. I mean, come on, look at the new gods, seriously. Like, they're not, it's not a horror comic, right? So he, his thought was that he was going to write the, write, he's like, look, I'll write this first issue, we'll set it up, and then hand it to another writer or whatever, so I can get back to what I want to do, which is new gods and forever people. Unfortunately, for Jack Kirby, he did too good a job. And I don't know if they canceled New Gods and Forever People in order for him to do Demon or they put him on hold. But I think I want to say they canceled the comics and said, hey, we're going to put you on this. This is going to be great. And he was just like, oh, what? This is not. No, that's not how this was supposed to work. But then he ended up doing this Demon series. I don't know how long the original comic series went on for. I think he did the first like. I want to say he did the first like dozen, 15, 24 issues, basically like it happens now. Like you'll get a, you'll get a creative team that works on a comic for the 12 issues and it, everybody loves it. And then they switch teams to continue it because it's kind of supposed to be going on its own at that point, but it always feels different. It's like getting a new director for a TV series or whatnot. And so that's kind of where Demon came from. And I think he was inspired by the old classic comics when they do like Ivanhoe or Robin Hood or whatever in the classic comics thing. And Prince Valiant was really big around that time, particularly in the newspaper too. And so I, that's where he's got that kind of old time, the way he's got the cape and why he has that outfit. I never understood, but like some design aesthetic he got from these old, like Prince Valiant comics and such was kind of the inspiration for the character. And I really like the demon as a character or and Jason Blood as this character. I always find I always think of Jason Blood being like, what if John Constantine had a demon inside of him? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like Jason Blood's kind of like John Constantine, but less dysfunctional. Yeah, it's like a, a demon other than all of the personal demons. <laughs> right. So, sorry. Like, You're literal correct. Demon. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Literal demon. Uh, John Constantine has more demons. <laughs> Jason Blood has one demon, but very powerful. That's the way I think you nailed it, Emily. That was great. <laughs> Speaking of Jack Kirby, there's actually a really interesting play about like the history of Jack Kirby in comics. This is oh. a very an intersection of the various Emily uh, interests that there is a play called King Kirby that was written by uh, uh, Crystal Skillman and Fred Van Lent. That is just kind of like not a biopic, but like a bio play. It is a semi-fictionalized account of his life and his like growing up into doing comics and his like struggles to regain his rights for various characters that he created and all of that stuff that happened with like DC and Marvel and what he wanted to do as a passion as passion projects like the like the new gods and things like that versus like what he kept being put on as like no do this thing do this superhero thing do stuff that's less weird kind of and yeah, it's an interesting, cool little play. If you're somebody who likes reading plays, check it out. It's cool. It's interesting. It's historical. I want to check it out. If you like the demon character, he shows up in a ton of other things, not just other comics, but um, there's literally, I mean, you can just go to like 
the Wikipedia page or whatever, but he's in the DC universe. Uh, he showed up in Justice League Unlimited. Yeah, Justice League Unlimited episode. It was called Kid Stuff, where yes, I want to say John Stewart and Superman and Wonder Batman Woman and, and Batman. Wonder Woman. Yeah, they all get turned into kids. It had Morgan Le Fay in it and Mordred, and the very he was fun in that episode. one. Yeah. That's it's a ridiculous episode, but he's in Brave and the Bold. He's in a Harley Quinn episode too. I do not watch Harley Quinn, but apparently he's in a Harley Quinn episode called a very problematic Valentine's Day special. So that's a thing. The the Justice League Unlimited episode that he's in uh, is where all of those characters get turned into kids. Just to clarify for listeners, it is very fun. It is very funny. John Stewart has to actually make Green Lantern a Green Lantern mask that looks like Kyle Rayner's mask, uh, Ion's like like Green Lantern masks because he needs glasses. Mm-hmm. He needed glasses when he was a kid. So he's back to be a kid. I love the moment that I think it's Superman after Wonder Woman tells all of them what to do and then walks away. Superman just t- turns to Batman and just goes, your girlfriend's really bossy. And Batman, little 10-year-old Batman, just goes, she's not my girlfriend. And mm-hmm, walks away. Right. <laughs> and it's amazing. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's that a, and a demon. And there's also a demon. And there's also a demon. Justice League Dark, the animated mm, animated yeah. movie, Justice League Dark has John Constantine and I think Swamp Things in it, Satana's in it, Etrigan's, you know, all the basically this like five arc <laughs> arc uh, Young Justice episode is like mini Justice League Dark, basically. I think Raven might be in it too, Justice League Dark, or there might have been the sequel. I don't know. So anyway. You can go check that character out in a bunch of other other places as well. So what else you got, Neil? Anything else? Any 16s or 17s for that matter? No, just the 17. There were no 16s that I noticed. But if there were, dear listener, let us know. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Emily, did you get everything? No, I think that's everything. Oh, the credit scene. Man, the credit scene. Yeah, we talked about that. All right, we talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I do love that Vandal's got to pull the pin and leave plan. You know? Like, also... Vandal wins in this. Like he he wins. Also, Phantom Stranger. Sorry. <laughs> I Phantom Stranger is one of those characters too that you just when he shows up, like this is a character who would show up in different things in other comics back when I was a kid. I don't know anything about him. Like I could talk about, oh, what the history of Swamp Thing is or whatever, but like Phantom Stranger, I don't know if Phantom Stranger has any background. He's literally just still this enigmatic. He's like the watcher in Marvel, basically. He just shows up and stuff. And the fact that he actually is actively participating in this event is really interesting to me. But I really, really like this take on Phantom Stranger as well. And the fact they even use him. I'm a little surprised that they didn't use... They already introduced the House of Secrets in the Secret episode in the first season. And so the Kane and Abel's House of Secrets and House of Mystery, I was kind of waiting for those to show up at some point. And they may have showed up in a background somewhere, but I don't I don't remember seeing it. So there's they've really tapped into the horror comic genre. And that's one of the beautiful things about one of the many beautiful things about Young Justice is the fact that they don't pull punches about the fact that the new gods exist in the same universe as, you know, a Justice League dark style series, as well as superheroes and super spies. And, you know, they just take everything and just unapologetically just stick it all together in one giant universe that's theoretically trying to make some kind of sense so yeah anyway i think that's it phantom stranger is my end of the sentence still not revealed the name the origins none of it since 1952 oh you looked up the history yeah i'm like there's nothing there's nothing he just shows up you know what actually i think it was phantom strangers in one of uh, what i think is one of the best episodes of um what was it uh, batman brave and the bold chill of the night he shows up I think Phantom Stranger shows up talking about the origins of stuff. Like, why aren't you darker than you? There, there, there's a universe in which you could have been darker than the way that you are in the show kind of a thing. It's a really good episode. You should check it out. But I'm pretty sure it was Phantom Stranger showing up and asking questions. I also love they're like, we'd like a non-enigmatic answer. And it's like, I don't I don't give answers. I only ask, give questions or whatever. And he just keeps asking more questions. I steer, but I cannot lead. That has always been my fate. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool take of Phantom Stranger. Anyway, cool. Let's see. What else do we got? What are we on to next? To the Canary Debrief. Stick around. Class is in session. 
in our Canary Debrief, we will be discussing what we can learn about the creative process in the episodes we review. And today, we're going to be talking about the main concept behind Vandal Savage and the idea that he is a character that has lived for a span of time that is beyond our personal reasoning. We can come up with theories and ideas about how a person would act, and to some degree we have to play inside of tropes so that it works on a larger scale. So one of the things to think about is always the historical perspective that a character could potentially bring when they live for hundreds, if not thousands of years. I often think of how do I play elves better, or dwarves, or in this case, how could I play Raish better? How could I play Vandal better? But the idea that that historical perspective, and you get to see some of that, obviously, in these episodes where that historical piece is brought to the forefront. But not only that, the potential for emotional depth that a character can have when having gone, you know, the adage that they will have forgotten more about a certain topic than other people will ever know. And what does that bring with it? Is it an emotional detachment? Is it different perspectives on different things because the rise and fall of literal societies that they've seen? And coupled with that is, okay, so what social connections are they potentially going to have? Is it that they choose not to connect to people because it doesn't matter? Or the second they figure out that they might last longer, you know, the idea that, okay, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to extend this invitation to Raish because he's he's been around. Or the idea that, well, Clarion's not that bad because I've been stuck with Clarion for thousands and thousands of years. So at least I can tolerate them or choose to do so because I can have and foster a connection in the same way that are all the other pieces and just pawns, just things to be used because there's a grand, you know, it's Vandal. There's a grand scheme a foot rather than the tenuous relationships of someone that only lives a hundred years at most, which then of course layers in the super fun moral and ethical views that a person could have, you know, the entire concept of this battle between Vandal and dark side eventually. But the idea that again, yeah, everyone's just a piece to be used in that final battle and anything to get between here and the victory of there. That's fine. Let's do it. It's completely irrelevant because of the end goal. That is it that just the ends perpetually justify the means because there only is ends and everyone else is just a means. I mean, it's one of those things where you have to find that fine line because all of this, the flip side could be it is a long lived character that is completely emotionally detached forgets everything just because they don't care enough and or nothing matters or every little bit matters because you have the time to make it matter. There's a lot that you can do with a character that lives for a really long time that can be interesting. It's just making the choice of what does this character become or what have they become. And I think that's the other thing is that Vandal, for the most part, is solidified in who he is because he's had a bit of time to figure out exactly what that means for him. The other thing you have to think about is like, is this some other layers that kind of work towards Vandal, but could also work for other characters is, do you have this level of secrecy that if you go out into the forefront and you are a very known figure in the world at large, then you need to start dealing with some things on different scales. Whereas if you stay kind of behind the scenes and orchestrate things, as you've seen by being with the light, the machinations can just continue on and on, and you just keep that rotating cast. I mean, look at the the people that have been on the light over the span of these seasons is this constant rotating cast of people that have the right things at the right time. Like, that's probably the only reason they're on there. And once that has been used up, well, off they go. Yeah, ultimately, you need to figure out what makes your long-lived character different than the short-lived characters that you have in whatever piece of fiction that you're writing, because that ultimately is what sets them apart. That longer lifespan is going to change their perspective comparatively to others. Positive, negative, anywhere in between. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. 
In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works we think Young Justice fans will love. And this one was brought to us by one of our amazing patrons on our Discord, Inevitable Fate. And they brought to my attention specifically that the Kid Flash Funko Pop was currently trending for none other than $16. And if it's one thing, dear listeners, that you know I love, it's 16s, whether it's in the show, out of the show, anywhere in between. So huge shout out to Evitable Fate for this. And definitely the coupled with that is go keep checking for that random Young Justice piece that you know you've been missing for your collection, whether it's straight through the Funko app, whether it's eBay, whether it's Craigslist, whether you're just knocking on doors to find what you need. Keep going. It's out there. All right. Well, let's head into crashing the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 4. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. What you guys got? So I didn't notice it until this watching... But when we go back to like, oh, this is the moment that Zatanna realizes, oh, these protégés could. That's my first note. Could potentially. Yeah. You have that same moment where Naboo looks like, does that downward look of realizing you're right. This host body is, is aging. What is a better solution? The idea is then planted of this, you know, this monologue via Vandal. Of that something could be different. Like without that conversation with Vandal, I don't think Naboo would have said yes later. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah. my note on that is how uh, when Child and Clarion are facing off, uh, they have the thing where they say the opposition's new arrangement is how they refer to it. And it's, it's Zatanna's idea for sharing the helmet that like we as the audience don't even know about yet, but is the catalyst for everything that is happening. Yeah, and it's interesting because they they're like, oh no, this happens. This is going to happen. It's almost like, and 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 they haven't even talked about it yet. So like, it's that thing where like they exist through time, kind of. Like, oh no, we know what's going to happen. It, it, it's been set in motion, and we know it's going to succeed. Like something is going to come out of this. So we're going to go deal with it now. Or even just the fact that the idea has occurred to her and that tips the scales enough That's to need to enough. intervene. Just thinking yeah. it is enough to be like some chaos panics uh, as it does. Yeah. Because, oh, no, somebody had a good idea. Time to throw child at the problem. Ugh. And creep. I'm telling you, man, creepy kids like ghost kids and stuff. It's like the creepiest thing for me. She is so creepy. She's yes, it taps into like some fundamental fears of this is not right in humans. Yeah. And it's funny because it's different than Clarion. Yep. Clarion doesn't do the same thing to me. He's just. But like because he's a weird that, teenager, which isn't as scary as a weird 10 year old. Yeah, maybe. How was my, maybe. How was my scream? I tried to give it what these what the humans call oomph. Yeah, oomph. <laughs> <laughs> also, just shout out to Erica Ishii for playing a fantastic, terrifying child. She's so terrifying. Oh my gosh. Yikes. Uh, yeah. Also, Gar is wrecked. Yeah. Hashtag. Gar has some issues. Connor isn't dead. The bus is fine. Don't worry about it. Those are my three notes that I wrote down. <laughs> the bus uh, is fine. Don't worry about it. I My other notes include... I just think it's very funny how many times we mentioned Constantine in this breakdown, considering that Constantine doesn't show up He's in this not arc. in the episode. Yeah, Even totally. though Constantine was the main like magical character that I deluded myself into being like, oh, he's going to show up as part of this. <laughs> Friend of the show, Ariel, and I had a whole thing going where we're like, so this is how he's going to show up and this is what his character is going to be like. We had a whole thing. <laughs> And of course, he's the one magical <laughs> character who doesn't show up during this. Well, arc. Say like, when they say like at one point, they're like, OK, you guys go get help. Right. And we're going to go recruit people or whatever. You go recruit people. We're going to go do our thing. I was like, oh, who are they going to recruit? Right. And they just went to go get the Justice League, basically. 
And they said, we're getting all the mystical people we can, but one of them was wizard. <laughs> I'm like, Cause... where's John? Where's Swamp Thing? Where's, where's like, where's the, there's, Everybody there's a few is. more on this list. You put, you put Blue Devil in this scene again. Somebody's got a thing for Blue Devil, which cracks me up. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if you get into the same issues with like Constantine had his own show on the CW. Um, Swamp yeah. Thing had his uh, own show oh. on Max. I mean, there was a version of Blue Devil in the Swamp Thing series, but it's still not the like title character. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but maybe maybe that was it. But also, honestly, like Jason Blood. I mean, if you're going to get John Constantine, you could you if you're going to get a demon, you need to get the right demon. And John Constantine has too many of the wrong demons. So I just delusionally wanted Constantine to be like Zatanna's weird ex that she has to deal with and stuff like that. A whole thing that I just thought would be hilarious. I don't even want to know. My main exposure to John Constantine as a character is through the the weirdest possible avenue. I read all of DC bombshells back in the day, uh, oh, which is the World good. War II Elseworlds yeah. thing. Uh-huh, it's a weird uh-huh. universe, but it's fun. Uh, and it's in a good that, yeah. uh, Constantine and Zatanna are dating and they're actually very sweet. Uh, it's a weird little subplot in that series, but I like it. Uh, so my brain was like, okay, but what if? I combine this with my general knowledge of Constantine and create a delusional young justice world. I'm pretty sh- I remember I have to go watch it again, but I think in the Justice League Dark movie, there was a thing between them as well. But I think m- this version of Zatanna, I feel like is I feel like would look at him and be like, uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> no, but this is what <laughs> I want. That's exactly what I want of, Zata- <laughs> of everybody being like. Why did you ever date this man? She's like, I don't know. He is a disaster. He's a disaster. He's like 12 disaster. You think Etrigan's bad. You should try all the demons living inside that guy. Yeah. And his whiskey bottle. Because, gosh, I just want Zatanna to have someone to banter with. <laughs> no, that would be Nightwing good. Nightwing yeah, hasn't sure. been in an episode with Zatanna in ages. <laughs> for yeah, someone to true. banter with. Uh, this was my delusional hope. But on on a different note, my other uh, crashing the mode foreshadowing thing for this episode that I thought of as we were discussing and made a note about is that I think it's interesting that um, the that Mary is the one in the sanctum who like almost touches the artifacts and has to get reprimanded and is once again, quote unquote, doing the wrong thing as foreshadowing that she is the one in their team that is like not at the same like is not as ready as everyone else to be part of this and is going to have the whole thing near the end of the arc of being like yeah no we can't trust you to be part of the magic squad and chaos will ensue and everything yeah i just think it's interesting there are all these little little things throughout this arc leading up to that of just like mary is a step out of sync with everyone else and that is dangerous because it could have been anybody. They could have done that with anybody, but they chose Mary. <laughs> when we when we see like Mary's power, she like she not only does she like she's absorbing power from other places, right? That's what she's doing. She's pulling it from these ley lines, but then she also ends up pulling it from Khalid and and um, Tracy. Yeah, right. So it feels like okay, she can sense power, and so she's like, "Ooh, what is this? Do I want to absorb a little of this? How about a little of this? A little appetizer? You know, like I feel like even subconsciously, Don't eat the book, she's, Mary." Don't need tr- it. <laughs> Not that one. Um, so I, I feel like maybe even subconsciously, she's just like, like, you know, it's like you're hearing that little buzzing noise and you just want to get a little closer and kind of see what that thing is. And she's doing it with all of those artifacts. And of course they do it for the gargoyles joke as well. But I think you're right. It, it, it sets her up. But man, I, I just watched these like these five episodes, like all in a row back to back. And um, man, they do such a good job with Mary. We'll talk about it later, but yeah. like that whole thing that the, the the peak at the end, it's just like, man, I get it. I get it. She does. She making the wrong choice. Absolutely. And also she's like, I, I am doing everything you've asked me to do. I'm doing everything you've asked me to do and the best that I can possibly do it. And you still aren't going to accept me for who I am. And I'm like, yeah, she's kind of got a point. She, I mean, she's got a point. The thing we'll get into it, but yeah, it's the thing of like, Mary senses power and we see in just the next episode that it's the thing of Mary 
likes power a little too much. She can't trust herself to use her Shazam form because like she got addicted to being too powerful in a yeah. weird, complicated way. And it's it's yeah, no, it's all all these little seeds leading up to the like that whole situation. We don't get to see the next part yet. I want to mm-hmm. see. Yeah. Anyway. One day. <laughs> One day we will. We have faith. Anything else, Neil? Uh, two things. One, I thought while we were discussing, uh, why did Vandal think Arian would be dead? Yeah, well, he says immortal. Yeah, and then he's like, well, then but he I don't, died. I'm like, is it, is it? But then he died, and I'm like, wait, immortal in age, but not, but still being able to be killed? Like, it, they seem to imply that it, immortal, there's one definition of immortal, Vandal's definition. So Arian shouldn't be dead. I wouldn't right? think, uh, well, I know he's not. Um, spoilers, he's not dead. Um, he's about as dead as there's a lot of people who aren't dead. Yeah, this he's season. about as dead as Connor. Yeah, that just dawned on me. I mean, I guess it, it could just be a mislead. I mean, but Vandal does think he's dead, so I mean, there is that, but I'm just confused as to why he would think it. Uh, the other one is the Cybax. I don't know if we've heard that term before, but we will certainly hear it again. Um, and it's basically using Simon. To, and from what I understand, using Simon to basically make a mental backup of other people. You just got a brain in a box. You, you know, you, you, uh, what is it? You format the drive and then you copy pasta the other person's drive on top of that one in case you need it, which is what happens with Ocean Master later. But then my obvious follow up question is how many people have they done that to? Because the number of people that they have just straight DNA on seems like limitless. Then subsequently, okay, do you have the DNA and some sort of mental backup for most of them? Yeah. I mean, it's a very freaking first episode. They're talking about like, uh, have the uh, genomes go ahead and download their memories and erase the originals. And I'm like, the implications of that whole sentence are ridiculous like why aren't they and this is where they get into it now but it's like why aren't they cloning them i mean it gets into a whole like what's not the movie the prestige what's the other movie oh no not the illusion the prestige yeah, yeah. i was like i think it is the prestige thing. i was thinking <laughs> well the illusionist and the illusionist and the prestige both came out at the same time and they were both weirdly about magic that wasn't magic yeah so it's like that i guess vandal doesn't vandal doesn't need anything theoretically i guess yeah, but I always think of that kind of thing as like a fail safe of like, you know, Dark Side shows up and it's just like, turn up the cloning and then just Superman's just come flying out. But if you do it too early, obviously everyone's going to get mad. But if you do it at the right time, you're like, well, I mean, what else are we going to do? I mean, I've got this and I've got that. They're right around the corner. I mean, is it that bad? Vandal has plans. He does have a plan, a plan or two. That's it. I think it's everything, yeah? <laughs> All right. Have we covered sounds good. everything that's to come, everything that's not to come, and just everything. I and John we, Constantine. And, <laughs> who's not and, and part of this arc. That didn't show up at all. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Crashing the Where moon you, was everything we're foreshadowing and everything we're not foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay Stay well, well, everyone. everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. 
Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.